Recording, Recording has started. All right, then uh, I want to uh, warmly welcome everybody who joined this uh, workshop here today on digital skills. My name is Carlos Hertel. I'm director at Science Business and at Science Business, I've been leading an effort for the past 10 months or so on digital skills that had two workshops, a report came out, which I think most of you have probably received by now. Um, it was meant to be published today, so I guess it goes out uh, later today. Um, I want to emphasize the session and want to, with a big thank uh, to EIT Health that EIT Health has been supporting this session and made it possible, for which we are very grateful. And we're also happy, of course, that we have a representative from EIT Health with us today on a panel, although this session is not meant to be truly a panel. So to all participants, feel free to interact, to uh, comment, to uh, give your, your, your viewpoints. Um, we don't want to have a panel discussion that everybody listens to and asks questions. We much rather want to have an engaged roundtable discussion, but we'll kick it off and stimulate thoughts by some first questions that I will ask to my special guest. I, I mentioned already EIT Health, so let me introduce to everybody here uh, on this workshop, Celine Carrera, who is the Education Director at EIT Health. A warm welcome and thanks again to you, Celine, for the good cooperation we had um, ahead of this workshop and uh, for your participation. Then we have the second person on this virtual panel, if I may call it like that, uh, Isabela Milewska. Isabela is Digital Skills Global Leader at Amazon Web Services uh, Training and Certification, and I think she probably has every day to do a ton with the question of are people that are getting out into the job market or are they already sufficiently prepared for the jobs that the digital age requires. Uh, two more people here. Uh, let me welcome Thomas Jorgensen, who is Senior Policy Coordinator at the European University Association. And the new requirements for graduates and of life, lifelong learning is something that the universities think about a lot. I'm sure Thomas can share with us some of the discussions that are ongoing in his circles. And then uh, the fourth person here on our panel is Dale Kummerle from, he joins us from Princeton, New Jersey. It's a long way, you've come a long way by, by cable <laughs> or by, by light wire, uh, Dale. Um, it's early where you are. Dale is the former executive director at MHD. So of course, a pharma company that all of you know. A post he held until very recently and throughout his career, he had to do a lot with education questions in the medical sector. So all of our four participants have uh, di direct ties into the question of education and of skill building among younger, but also also among the experienced workforce. Let me reiterate, uh, this is meant to be a, a, an open dialogue and we try to condense or distill or concentrate what we discuss here in maybe one, two or maximum three recommendations or asks, if you will, that I will pass on to Richard Hudson, my colleague at Science Business, who has a plenary session with Jean-Éric Paquet, the uh, general, Director General um, for Research, responsible for the large European research programs. And he's going to present some of our conclusions or maybe also our questions to him for his comments and for his answers. So keep that in mind. If it's only one, it's only one, and it's already good. They're the most important one, but if we can come up with two or three, even better so. So let's, let's get started. Um, uh, I'll first turn to, uh, as I said previously, to Celine. And I would like to know from you, Celine, give us an idea of what in EIT Health and the many programs that you have with industry and with academia, with early stage researchers, and of course also with the professionals, what you do about digital skills. What do you offer? What do you expect? And kind of like almost what progress have you seen over the past few years? So, uh... It is quite uh, central to EIT Health indeed, and so there's many efforts that are being uh, supported and driven at EIT Health around the, the, the theme of uh, digital skills. So, first of all, to, to understand the baseline and where we are starting from. So there was a, a major report that was written with McKinsey and EIT Health and was published in March this year where was, okay, what is the state of affairs and how digital skills is going to be um, uh, center stage for the transformation in Europe that's, uh, that needs to, to take place. Then we've combined this with a kind of needs assessment effort is that we use our national partners and, and, and co-location centers 
through a, a series of round tables whereby there are discussions and we try to contextualize the needs and see, okay, regionally, what does it mean? Where are we? Uh, and is there any gap between, you know, what should be and where, where we, we want to, to go? And that is then integrated into the strategic uh, thinking where when we develop the portfolio of activities. And so what has been done, where, well, for instance, in the education portfolio, we have engaged with the academia, we have a series of uh, degree programs, be it masters or PhDs, whereby the digital skills or various uh, topics around that theme are addressed. And we try then to uh, nurture those skills from that early uh, stage in career. And we've also uh, deployed some uh, educational interventions for what we call executives and professionals, uh, healthcare professionals or executives in the healthcare sector. They're again addressing um, th that shift and that need in, in digital skills. What we are also focusing increasingly for the past two years is to uh, integrate the citizen and patient aspect. So we have systematically now we integrate a citizen and patient engagement or involvement in our uh, educational interventions, but we're also trying to focus on, uh, well, the, the, the population and addressing the potential gap between, okay, it's all fair enough, there's a lot of innovation pushed to, to, to the market and to society, but is the population adapted? Are they going to embrace it sufficiently? And so that is the last uh, aspect we, we also focus on. Uh, thank you, Celine. Let me, let me ask a follow-up question. You are in a, in a special situation in that, the, like the other EIT activities, there's always a combination between the private sector and the academic sector, and research yes. organizations, universities work together with, with companies. Um, if you look at it across the board, would the companies rely on the educational sector to deliver it, uh, the digital skills, I mean the programs and improving the skills, first, or would they say, ah, you go do this with the undergraduates, that's okay, but we take care of our own people, so we do these programs in-house. How does that play out today? Give us an, an idea. Well, it's not as, as exclusive as you depict it. Uh, well, actually, one of the key principles uh, at EIT Health is that a program must be uh, supported by a consortium. It has to be collaborative per se. So we do not have um, a single stakeholder organizing themselves an educational inter intervention. It's, uh, it wouldn't fit our inclusion criteria. Uh, now, the, 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 the private sector are focusing, I suppose, uh, of, of course, they, they have programs to educate themselves. And what we understand is that they are reaching out to us for complementarity. So they would go for digital skills, but looking at, say, innovation or, you know, not purely for digital skills, if, if that makes sense. But it's yeah. always, yeah, collaborative, yeah. All right. Let us stay with the health care space for a moment and let me uh, turn over to Dale. Um, Dale, give us an idea. I mean, you have seen educational programs. Uh, your industry for many, many years. Uh, what, what is your on your wish list concerning digital skills, which didn't play such a great role 20 or 15 years ago? What's on your wish list? What, what do you think is missing when you when you look at the scene broadly? Um, very good question. And you know, I I always have to start off with you know I, I've you know when you work with one company, you know one company, right? Yeah, uh, sure. but. Fortunately, I have worked with multiple uh, large pharma companies uh, over my career, and also I'm involved with the International Pharmaceutical Alliance for Continuing Medical Education, so a group of about 18 different companies, uh, many of them based in Europe, uh, that get together and talk about just these kinds of, uh, of topics as to how can we engage uh, with new technologies and 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 the future and the futures forum, example, for example. Um, so you know, looking at this, what's really interesting, and, and I read the uh, the report that you sent out yesterday, Carlos, um, with regards to uh, digital skills, and it's quite amazing how, uh, at least in my experience, people 
don't have a full grasp of digital skills even within the pharmaceutical industry where you would expect to maybe see that more. Um, what I see is that there is a definitely a desire to better understand digital skills and particularly uh, uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, as well as um, uh, you know these these you know machine learning and and how does that relate? And people w understand that it's there and they want to implement it, uh, but they really don't really understand how it would work within the pharmaceutical company. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you know, it's amazing if people actually learn how to use the tools that are available from uh, for them from just let's say Microsoft Office and and Microsoft Excel and how to do pivot tables and how to do some of the more advanced stuff is really lacking. And unfortunately, from my experience and what I've seen, you have of course pockets of people who do know it uh, for their job because that's part of their job. But when it comes to a wider you know, a deeper understanding, that's what I'd like to know is, is I'd like to have a better understanding of, uh, you know, a better uh, implementation of digital skills and understanding of digital skills so that people can have, you know, a, a context within which to use some of these new, uh, these new technologies that are coming like uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. If, if that yeah. kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah, th thank you. Let me ask you sort of a similar question I asked to Celine, namely looking forward, uh, who do you think is going to provide those trainings and those educational opportunities? Should it be the the academic sector? Is that a primary role they should play also for upgrading the skills that, that is there today in, in the existing workforce? Not, I'm not talking about undergraduates and graduate students, but everybody or do you think companies themselves just have to kind of get their act together and and be much more active in uh, in upskilling their own people how do you see that so i think that the tendency is to want to do it internally uh you know there are it departments within the pharmaceutical companies uh, but to be quite honest they're many times overwhelmed and very much focused on you know the tools uh, of the trade, so for clinical trials or, or other things, uh, and the artificial intelligence and the integration of uh, machine learning into the daily routine, into the into the workflow, is kind of a pilot basis where it's just done very piecemeal, and only if there seems to be somebody that's interested. I mean, I, I've had an interest in this for for a very long time. And have tried to shepherd, you know, organizations, you know, from uh, the whole entire medical affairs group to try to understand it. And it really, they don't understand the context of which we could use this. Um, until I read your report, I really had never, unfortunately, thought of academia as a resource that was available to pharma. Um, I think what we tend to do is have you know, other companies uh, that specialize in this type of uh, activity. Maybe a professional society would be one that we would go mm -hmm. to. But uh, I really was intrigued by, you know, thinking about academia as a resource for the pharmaceutical industry. Cool. So I will give the, the word to Thomas, not now, but after the next uh, intervention, because he can then wrap it up. <laughs> especially concerning the role of universities, how they interpret their role going forward, what role they want to play, and maybe also some of the role books that they have. However, I want to have uh, Isabella first heard. Uh, I mean, at Amazon Web Services, uh, I mean, there's you, you need people of, of all kinds of backgrounds, but you need a lot of people with really hard digital skills, not only the application understanding, but really when it comes to the fundamentals like algorithms and then cloud services and cloud systems and so on. Isabella, give us an idea of what you find is lacking today when you look at applicants on the job market and also what do you have to do internally to sort of compensate for that. But maybe you don't find it a compensation, maybe you find it it's your natural role anyhow, but, but give us an idea how you see that. Thanks a lot, uh, Carlos, and uh, thanks for um, having me today. Um, so that was a very good question with regards to, to what are the fundamentals and what we see uh, let's say globally from let's say medium to hard uh, to to let's say advanced 
digital skills is that uh, with um, growing number of vacancies that are relying on cloud skills, and cloud skills being the sort of the fundament uh, for any other sort of technology trends. So AI, machine learning, uh, security, advanced networking, and so on. All that starts from the very fundamentals of, of cloud services. And because cloud has really um, changed the paradigm of how we provision IT infrastructure, it also changed the skill set that is required uh, on, on the labor market. And one would say that on one hand, um, digital skills are absolutely critical, but basic digital skills is, is nowhere near where we need to aim for. Uh, it definitely needs to go much further and much much beyond um, and aim at um, our technical skills. That being said, as I mentioned, as cloud computing has really changed the paradigm, uh, we may not necessarily really always need, uh, you know, a, a five years um, degree uh, on, on each CV, uh, everybody that needs to uh, complete um, computer science a master's program in order to thrive in a cloud job market. In fact, uh, the paradigm that has shifted really enabled to streamline a lot of those processes within IT departments. And so uh, now the required skill set is uh, partially the, the hard technical skills, but also soft and business skills that are necessary. Um, and much of this is also related to the fact that, uh, you know, it is no longer that, let's say, IT department works in a silos within the organization. An IT professional or uh, IT technician actually needs to understand and collaborate with a lot of different departments such as marketing, legal, procurement, and all sorts of lines of businesses. So so to to kind of like come to, to a conclusion for the required skill set, as I mentioned, is on one hand, uh, look up for the, the medium and, and advanced digital skills as a uh, you know hard requirement. Uh, in that sense, uh, and on the other hand, really being able to excel in professional skills, so understanding the business, being open to the fact that you need to learn every single day for the rest of your professional life, to, for that matter. And so within AWS, um, uh, we obviously have a lot of, uh, let's say, enablement programs so that Whoever we, we are employing, that person has a launch plan, has a full onboarding plan, specifically for technical roles. There's a lot of uh, emphasis on, uh, on the continuous learning, really, for solutions architects or for you know, technical consultants. But um, apart from, let's say, the enablement side, uh, from my perspective, we are, and my department, training and certification focuses on what can we do externally to try and bridge that uh, skills gap. And so we've developed an, a wealth of education programs that are aimed at helping understand, first of all, what is cloud, what you can do with it, how you can actually accelerate both your digital transformation as well as your career progression, for that matter. Uh, and what are the learning pathways that you can, ch that you can take in order to to uh, see yourself, you know, becoming a cloud technician, a solutions architect, uh, or even uh, you know, a cloud systems administrator. So we work with a lot of with uh, universities, uh, with also workforce development organizations, because we acknowledge the fact that there's just not enough of ICT professionals on the market. And for the, uh, frankly speaking, universities are also not producing those graduates uh, fast enough. So we're looking at the sort of the so-called alternative pipeline. And so the non-traditional learners <clears throat> that can join the cloud job market and get started faster 
than um, for spending three to five years at the university. And, you know, by no means this is uh, any uh, uh, diminishing factor for or uh, argument for universities as such. We do need very well educated individuals to become those cloud leaders. We do collaborate with universities, but there's just so much, there's a wealth of uh, job roles that could be um, filled on, on the labor market that not necessarily require five years uh, computer science and it can get you faster there. So we look at vocational education uh, a little bit closer and how to make sure that those dual uh, training and job programs uh, are, are coming along and um, enriching with the curriculum needed for, for cloud services. Uh, but we're also looking at supporting the unemployed individuals that want to transition from whatever they have been doing before to the cloud job market. And it's just to say that, you know, this demand is just so overwhelming, it's not just about Amazon or Amazon Web Services, but we are just looking at the entire uh, sort of um, ecosystem of AWS customers and partners that demand that talent. Thank you. That, that's, that's very good insights. I think it resonates in, in various ways with, um, a discussion I had just last week at the opportunity of the ESOF conference. We talked about digital skills, but also it kind of like aligns with recent reports of other large tech companies who have decided to go a path where they issue their own certificates and would recognize those as equivalent to academic certificates in certain domains. This is, this is pretty much unheard of, I'd say. And it it's, of course makes all the, all the more sense when you say the demand is so immense there's the pipeline is just dry, so we have to do things ourselves. And I can imagine that people who undergo programs at companies want to say, but look, if I do this, right, I want to have some certification around it. Uh, it's hmm. going to be something which is recognized and not just an internal program that I went through and that's valueless outside. And that changes the way I think how universities, especially in this space, not in other domains, but in this domains, how they have to act or position themselves. And then that's the segue here, of course, to you, Thomas. After listening to all of this, give us an idea of how the discuss internal discussion in the university is. is what role should they play here? Uh, how could they do better what they're doing? And what's kind of like the future perspective? Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, to no surprise, of course, the university sector is, is hugely important here. And, and it's, not, it's not that <clears throat> we are sort of against private companies doing their own, even certified training, uh, I think. Uh, there is a there's a good uh, acknowledgement that this happens uh, within the academia and and at the same time also saying well I mean they they have a role and we have a role and and the, the short story of that is that in universities you learn in the context and and I think that's that's important for for for, for my my points here um, I'll I'll try to be short so we can get a, a discussion going. But uh, I wrote a small paper about this where I distinguished three groups, and I think still think it's a good way of, of, of thinking about it in, in high-level digital skills. And the first is what we've been talking about. Those are the specialists, the programmers, the, the ones that have hard uh, data and, 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 and digital skills. And, and we know they're too few. We know they're too few, but I think we also have to recognize that we actually don't know, we don't have a consensus about what constitutes a shortage. That's, uh, we, we, we simply don't know that, and the data is not there. The, the kind of graduate tracking that you can do, uh, it's not granular enough. I mean, we know from OECD, yes, ICT graduates have very high employment rates, but some of them also have very low employment rates, and it's actually the biggest difference between the two is an ICT. Um, so we have, we have those, those specialists. Part of the pipeline is really needs to be done before universities. It's about getting getting women into uh, into, <clears throat> into science and into these these uh, these fields. Um, and it's also again, I said, learning in a context. Some of this is also how what what skills, as Isabella said, what what other skills do these people need in terms of understanding privacy, in terms of understanding ethics, and 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 other things. It's a great uh, Broekel article about uh, that just came out from this Brussels-based think tank. I can maybe post a link uh, about you know 
do we have an AI shortage? And, and it also says, yeah, the data is just not, it's just not there. Then the second group uh, is very interesting. And I think that that speaks very well to the EIT help. Help is the, those that have, are in highly disrupted sectors, typically graduates that go into specific uh, professions. Uh, if you're uh, in the medical field, you will have to learn how to work together with, for instance, um, visual recognition and machines that do part of your diagnosis and, and how, do you, how do you supervise, how do you deal with that. I personally find uh, law extremely interesting because not only do you have to know how you create a contract with a, a, um, a text generating software and, and, and that's very advanced, but also how can you contest decisions that are made by machines in the public sector first. Uh, that's, that's, so th there you need to know, have certain skills because your profession has been disrupted. But the first and the second group are relatively small. And then you have the, the big third group, and that's typically for universities. We don't know where they go. We, we don't educate them for a specific job, but we understand that they can use the digital transition in all the jobs they come, no matter where they go. So they need some kind of exposure to this. And this is particularly where, where universities can do that because you can get that exposure, for instance, in interdisciplinary teams, you get that exposure through research-based learning uh, where you, people in your environment will tell you, well, actually you can, you know, you can use text mining to get that to answer your question in a robust way in in history or or, or elsewhere, um, so they don't need they don't need to learn code, but they need to learn how to ask the questions for those that can actually code the things, and and that's that's really our big group. And I'll just end up and say we we actually we begin to have data about this. We I got some really fresh data. I mean this is like last month's fresh data that where we ask you know how do you provide digital skills within university, and it's it's a, a slightly biased sample, but it's still very good. Um, it's not that you have a blanket coverage of digital skills all over the place, but everybody does this in one way or the other, either through uh, voluntary courses. Um, I'll just, just get the numbers here so I can read them on my screen. Um, you know, things like general digital literacy, uh, you have over half of, of the respondents say we have that for everybody. This is this is an all or most study programs, and and another uh, good forty percent that say uh, yeah, but this is either in specific disciplines or it's 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 voluntary. Uh, so so it's not that universities are, are waking up to this. These things are in the in the um, in the curricula, but of course it's it's fitness for purpose. So it's not that we have you know, a set of five learning outcomes that everybody should have. Uh, that's, that's, that's not how student-centered learning works, uh, works these days. Um, so I think, I think I'll, just, I'll just stop there and say um, that, well, I think what is really important here is a differentiated approach. It's, Good. it's something everybody needs to learn something about this, but they need to learn different things depending on what they want to do with their, with, with their life and, and with learning. Uh, and, and some of these things might be provided by Google, but it's not going to be uh, that kind of, of context, contextual exposure that you can get in universities. That, that's our added value. So I'll just finish up there. Thank, thank you for that, Thomas. Uh, let me um, ask a short follow-up question and to kind of uh, follow on a point that Isabella made. It's the one thing is the hard skills. I think uh, if you are in computer science, you get most of the hard skills probably taught that, that are important. The critical... Uh, gap is the understanding uh, that is tied to a specific application, a specific business context. I talked to a, a company recently who said uh, the actually the educational background, and, and Isabella will smile when I say that, the educational background uh, concerning which subjects people had studied didn't really matter all that much for professional success. The question was whether they had during their studies exposure already to the application of new IT technologies and analytic methods in a specific uh, application context, in a healthcare context or an industrial context. Uh, in some, some countries and some 
kinds of universities and some countries are really good at connecting, I would say, the practical side with the educational side, and some other disciplines in other countries are, are not good at that at all. Is that something that needs to be looked at broadly, that when we look at digital skills, we try to always also in the earlier education tie it to a specific application rather than in an abstract form in a classroom? Um, do we have to break up those silos? I mean, the connection between the education sector and industry or the application side, is it close enough for the digital age or do we have to get better at that? I, we can always get better. I, we can always get better and, and, and I think I, I think it's right. It, it's one of the, the challenges you have in this. I mean, we are going through a period of innovation in learning and teaching. And, and it's one of the challenges we have is breaking down the silos uh, at, at, at all levels and engage in, in things like challenge, multidisciplinary challenge-based learning, which is something that everybody knows works. You put students from different disciplines. It's what we call T-based. They, they need the, the, the deep knowledge of their own discipline but they also need the broad knowledge of what other disciplines can do. And this is this is what universities are aiming for. One of the, the means is this challenge-based learning. Many, many people swear swear to that. Um, and, and it's going on. And sure, you can get better. You also need better framework conditions. If if you have very rigid program accreditation structures, it's difficult to, to put up a new disciplinary disciplinary program. And and you need, and I think that that if we want to say anything to Paquet, um, one thing is the research, the research-based learning, so that students are directly engaged as not only as subjects but also as contributors to the research process, uh, and this is where they get this application. This is where they see these things, and yeah. and they get at the edge of at the edge of of, of what happens, um, and and uh, that need that has to do with the also with the synergies in EU funding. That when Paquet funds research, he actually also thinks about the students. And how how students are engaged as contributors, or as 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 Celine was saying as well, the engagement of citizens and of learners, because students, traditional students, are by far not the only learners that we that we cater for. So that's that's an important issue. Yeah, research funding as a skill building program. It's not that 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 has never been the case, but I don't think anybody had had ever pronounced it like that. But it may this may have to change. In, in indeed, way. indeed, it's, it's, it's a much it's more explicit way. part of it. Yeah, and, and that, that that education programs should think more about research, and research programs should think more about about education. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Very good. Now we have a group here of about twenty five individuals. I, I invite everybody to contribute. I mean, uh, switch on your your microphone and your camera so we can see you, and add, you can also type in to the chat function if you have a comment or if you have a question. You can also do that. I certainly have a ton of question here by my side, but I actually want to make sure I tie in the rest of the group here. So if, if any ideas from your end worthwhile sharing or you think an, an interesting point you want to make, just feel free to do so by, by whatever means you find appropriate. Shout it, shout it out if you like to. Let me see where we stand here in the... Um, oh yeah, here we go. There's a question. And then let me, let, me, let me ask these questions first, which came in through the chat. I have to look at those. Um, uh, oh, this is uh, quite a few. Um, how do you, uh, Lara Portiati uh, from RSE, oh, this is from Italy. I'd like to ask speakers, how do you see the role of institutions and public authorities in this topic? Um, let, me, let, me, let me leave it at that, just as a follow-up question to that. But uh, let me start here with Celine, because your EIT Health is so broad, you, you cover also public uh, authorities and institutions. How do you see that? What role can they play? Well, um, and well, we, and we are engaging them increasingly. I mean, traditionally we've been uh, collaborating with the academia, the uh, research organization, the industry, and uh, but increasingly we're reaching out to uh, uh, regional councils and and regional health agencies to to. Uh, to, to nudge the, the 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 change there as well, huh? and um, for ex for example, we we are trying to look at the moment to to the point made uh, uh, earlier by by Isabella and uh, echoed by Thomas is that there's a gap between we've identified between those graduates that come out of their um, uh, academic programs and um, them being change agents, uh, getting jobs, and so on. So 
or being for, for what concerns us, entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs. And so we are trying to in, involve the um, institutions to, to have uh, bridge programs by which they would have uh, hands-on uh, educational interventions within uh, some of those institutions and uh, make make something that possibly was a bit still abstract when they ended up uh, and did their studies and work concretely on some uh, actual issues. One of our programs, that, uh, for example, is uh, Innovation Fellowship, whereby we are completely engaging the institutions um, and have those uh, trainees or learners actually work at those institutions and take a real real life issues uh, issue and, and, and look at how they can innovate and bring uh, uh, the digital uh, aspect in there. So that's high on the agenda, but definitely work in progress. And there's some cultural differences there, just to make sense, you know, as, you, as some of you said, uh, some countries out there already, in some other countries, there's a bit of a change uh, management to trigger. Yeah, which makes, which makes you wonder on the European level, uh, since we, again, talking to Paquet at the end of the day, is that something that the European Union should push for, that we have a broader dissemination of best practices, um, and uh, so not everybody does it there or his or her way, but there is an understanding of what has really worked well and that everybody learns from those. I mean, EIT Health could be one of these vehicles to drive sure. it, since you are cross-sectoral in a sense, at least, and you are certainly international. Yes, we can. Yeah, on the implementation side, because we do have that uh, local uh, footprint uh, in various regions, so we we can actually surface, you know, evidence on what has worked, what has not, and what would be the specific needs. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Then Alexei Kolodkin asks the questions. Uh, I think it's pretty much directly also to your your statement, Isabella, is uh, the combination of technical, say, cloud computing related skills as an example with the soft side of things. I mean, we call it soft, although it's pretty hard. It's about business and uh, mm -hmm. taking things, I mean, ultimately taking things successfully to market. Should that be something that is combined in the individual or is it much rather uh, a situation of combining silos so that here are the guys with the hard know-how and here are the guys with the soft know-how mm -hmm. that work together? Or do you see it more, Isabella, as holistic, a person, the individuals need to understand the bigger picture, otherwise they, they can't be productive? I definitely see it as, as really the, the skill set that um, is represented in one person. Uh, and it is very much because, as I mentioned, uh, cloud particularly has really changed how we provision IT infrastructure. So it also changes how IT department uh, operates. So no longer in the silos as a sort of, uh, you know, um, a team that just is focusing on um, the actual production or maintenance of, of uh, IT systems. That IT department needs to actually partner with the rest of the sort of lines of business within the organization, better understand their needs, say, from marketing perspective or marketing strategy perspective. Uh, uh, a company needs to sell their products online these days, right? They need to uh, present their product in an in a appealing way to the consumer. It all happens online, and it will not happen without support from the IT department. So that ICT professional not only needs to understand how to develop a website, how to uh, code an application, uh, that IT professional needs to also understand what, are the, uh, what is the strategy, what do we want to accomplish, what are the business metrics, and so on. And on top of everything else, um, you know, digital transformation brings about a huge change for all the organization. And sort of IT department or ICT professionals uh, need now to become basically change agents. They know how to use technology in order to align with business needs. But they also need to speak the same language with the CEO, with the marketing director, with the procurement manager, and so on. And so, again, it, it is the combination of the hard technical skills with the, um, with the notion of uh, being exposed and manage change, ambiguity, 
being uh, open to learn every single day uh, to embrace the whole technology innovation that is uh, that is out there. And so I'd say, and, and we try to do this within uh, AWS Training Institute. And so our curriculum really uh, is not just about you know, introducing a product, a service, and from technical point of view, how does it look like, what you can do with it, uh, but our cu curriculum also provides real uh, life scenarios and examples whereby you actually can be tasked to, uh, to draft or design an architecture based on the business factors and the business objectives of the organization. That goes far beyond what, let's say, traditionally IT professionals have been taught uh, at universities or at schools, just focusing on programming languages and so on. It combines uh, the skills of you know, technical aspects and understanding the technology with understanding business needs and what digital transformation brings about to the organization. Yeah, since uh, Isabella, since you also sort of describe what you do internally, and we talked about other companies, tech companies in particular, having their own educational programs and certifications, um, I paraphrase a, quickly a question that, from, that came in from Rainish Tivari. Isn't that a beautiful opportunity for a public-private partnership uh, between oh, absolutely. the educational sector and industry? Absolutely, without a doubt. And in fact, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do collaborate with universities, offer uh, ready-to-teach, free-of-charge curriculum. We first teach the educators how they can approach the curriculum and how they can teach the students in order to prepare them for uh, real-life scenarios and for AWS certification to pass the exams. Uh, and so this is, a, this is absolutely a public-private partnership. And I think uh, one of the comments were, was uh, on the chat implying that maybe private companies should replace universities. By no means at all. It needs to be a combined effort. Um, I think what we are calling for is more just uh, flexibility, openness, and also inclusion of those industry-led certification in the process of designing um, academia curriculum and accreditation of those uh, master's programs and so on. Okay, very good. Let me ask the, sim the same question sort of to Dale. From your experience in the uh, in the pharma sector or in the the healthcare sector, how do you see that a stronger, for, more formalized collaboration between the public and the private sector, especially around skill building and experiences, of course, gaining experiences? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very critical uh, point, and I think that's something that definitely is needed, uh, you know, on, on a wider scale. I mean, I think there is some of that that's being done, but very very uh, small uh, places and more in the kind of a pilot type of activity mm -hmm. or maybe siloed. Um, I think, you know, just bouncing off some of the comments that I've heard, I, I think a lot of times what happens at least in, you know, non-tech focused companies is that the IT department is, you know, not in, in a, a, a position to provide the guidance in digital skills and training because they're seen more of as a service. They're the ones that you go to when you're, you know, when your computer fails, you know, <laughs> and, and you can't log in. Um, I mean, what we really need to do is we really need to change the culture of the company altogether towards a, a continuous learning and, a, and not think of digital skills as, oh, they'll learn it on their own because they're gonna need it for their job, but actually to have a culture of learning within the organization uh, is to me so very critical. And you can you know, do that internally, but I think the, 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 the industry public you know, academia relationship is something that needs to be fostered, at least you know, hearing what I hear here, you know, from the other panelists, it seems to me to be something that's very exciting, and that kind of collaboration could definitely just improve uh, the situation tremendously with from a 
uh, industry perspective, from a pharma perspective. Yeah, th thank you, Dale. Here's a question from Valerie Zwilling. Um, and she asked, yeah, certainly there is a need for uh, the deep technical skills, analytics and uh, algorithms and so on. But what about the culture of data at the era of open science and open innovation? Is the culture, is the culture change towards to who does it and, and how and to whom? And actually, that's a question I like to ask to Thomas. Since Thomas, you brought up there's, of course, many disciplines in academia that have not directly to do with the hard skills but they will be exposed to the realities of data being used in many ways, uh, be it either to, to replace human labor in the past or to augment or to support, be it in legal, be it in history, be it in, in marketing, wherever. How do you see that? Uh, how, do we know actually how to teach the culture aspect of living in an era and, uh, of, of data and, and in a sense, IT everywhere? Yeah, I, I think I think we we know. I think um, <clears throat> if you look at those universities that really work in in open innovation and are deeply engaged in the ecosystems, they have. I mean, they they do this also very practically through saying you can actually learn by solving a problem for a company. You can do that as your as your master's thesis, and you get into that culture. Um, and and there are universities that have that as their brand. Um, but but I, I want to say about this working with industry, um, it goes both ways. It's, it's very much also about universities having a dialogue with industry when they, when they promote their programs and when they plan their programs and have that as a, as a co-creation within that open innovation ecosystem. Uh, how do you do that? Um, that's the word of caution. I think I think that the caution is when the company when the company comes with the 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 package, say we we have a curriculum for you. You just need to 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 implement that. I, I think um, that's that's something we 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 would say that that we can have an added value. With it's a co-creation process. It's not about giving from one side a package, and 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 I don't want to bash. Amazon or any other, you know, tech giant in particular, but uh, I mean, giving already mighty tech giants more power through also actually uh, having them define the skills that are necessary. That might be a political question that that needs to be that needs to be uh, to be answered. Um, but yes, open innovation is important. Open innovation in terms of engagement in that ecosystem uh, with with the partners and and having doing your, your 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 learning with with companies absolutely yeah actually that fits to a follow up question that Reinisch was asking here and that's what i want to pass on again here to the to our uh, to our panelists and that is um, what are what would you wish of universities what are the key challenges in collaboration as of now because some of the things are just companies and universities are on different missions very naturally so there's an overlap of interest but there's also divergence in some points but then there's also the, I mean, let me just be very blunt, the questions of, can we get it together administratively, right? Can we get it organized, really, even if everybody is good-willed? There's not always ill-will that gets in the way. It's sometimes just good old, plain old bureaucracy, in a sense. Celine, you are working with, with companies and with universities. Uh, do you think there is, I would say, too much sand in the, in the gearing here? Or is, is it actually going very well once the partners know each other? Well, uh, a bit of both. I think there's a different, administratively, it, it, it can be uh, complicated in terms of the, the, the biorhythm is different. Yeah, I think at least, uh, the, the universities, you know, to, to make change happen is maybe uh, following a kind of rhythm. Whereas if you take a, a, a partnership with a, a company, uh, uh, then it can the decision making can be faster and and so the difference of biorhythm can sometimes be a bit cum cumbersome. Uh, there's also a bit of uh, territoriality, if I may say. Yes, of course, where so we are pushing consortia and uh, we actually mandate that at least two countries be involved and that it, there's a mix of the various uh, partner types, um, so that there can be some. Uh, some territoriality and, and uh, conflict is a big word, big word because once a consortium is, is, is created and we have a good sense of what the respective roles are, then they usually work pretty well. Yeah, once the agreement is 
I think the getting the collaborative framework right from the beginning is very important. Um, one, one, one change uh, action we've actually, actually implemented at the IT Health is that we've developed a new way of uh, pushing proposals to EIT Health to get support from the EU. And so we have a, a, a call process, which means you have to think 18 months ahead of time of your proposal. And by the time you come out, you know, it's 18 months later, we've designed a new process whereby we are out of that call because obviously 18 months in terms of digital and uh, contextual needs is, is not working. So we will observe this to see whether uh, universities uh, can play a role in that more agile uh, kind of process. Very good. Thank you, Celine. So I, I, I've seen I've seen no direct recommendations here from the audience. A couple of questions, which was great. Thank you all for that. Let me go into the final round and then ask my guests here, my my co-panelists, the question: What if you had one one thing on your wish list to Jean Eric Paquet? Uh, and look and look at him as the person who is wondering how to spend a very significant amount of R and D funding uh, into some of the fundamental research programs, some of it very applied, public-private partnerships, missions-driven stuff. I mean, all kinds of things that that funding goes into. And so that is a force, certainly, to be reckoned with, and that some can change things and move things in the right direction, change it for the better. So if you had just sort of one thing that comes to your mind, all the four of us, what would you recommend him or ask him this afternoon or leave leave as a recommendation with him? Let me start from the university side. You, I mean, research-based learning and learning and research combining. Thomas, um, how, how would you how would you bake that into a recommendation or an ask to Jean-Éric Paquet? Uh, it's it's the synergies and and thinking about synergies not only in terms of does it administratively fit together that you use different kinds of funding, but actually plan things so that you have synergies in terms of 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 content and uh, <clears throat> DG Research actually did that pretty well with the last call for for European universities, where they had you know this is what Erasmus does on one side, and this is what we do on the other side, and the content of those two fit together. And and I think you know when when you do calls and 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 when you do projects, think about what is the opportunity for 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 students to be part of that. Is there learning? Is a learning element in it? Uh, of course, without going into the the turf of of the Erasmus program, but but there is a, a large gray zone between the two. Okay, very good. Thank you, Isabella. I don't think you, in your role, go after European research funding directly. But anyhow, I mean, you look around you. There's a lot of research money being spent, and you probably are wondering how could that money be spent in a way that benefits also the needs of companies that have a huge demand for the appropriately trained talent. What would you what would you recommend from your vantage point to someone who is overseeing large research programs? No, oh, you're right. Uh, in terms of research funding, I'm not uh, very much uh, fluent at, at that topic. However, uh, we do uh, work a lot with uh, EU funding, such as Erasmus um, or the European Social Fund. So, in that respect, uh, uh, I, I can I can well, I feel I may have some recommendations in my uh, my recommendations are basically two. One is the flexibility in uh, reducing the administrative uh, burdens as much as possible. But specifically on the on the flexibility, I mean here really opening up to uh, the private sector as much as possible. Because you know, um, in general, all research at university uh, is is great but only when it is applied in actual uh, commercial version of, of of the solution or product or service only then it could be um, really uh, relevant for the for the economy and for the uh, society so I'd uh, really advocate for opening to towards private sector as much as possible including private training providers that could play a role uh, and that would shorten the, the cycle between, um, you know, uh, developing a curriculum at universities versus applying that technology innovation and curriculum immediately through those private channels. That's one thing. And second thing, 
uh, I would like to see uh, some sort of uh, outcome related to path to employment. So how much the efforts that we are making are either um, increasing the probability that the student, the researcher, will have greater chance for either continuing or maybe another career in that area? And how does this reflect the actual uh, sort of uh, job market uh, in that sense? So those two elements on my end. Thank you very much. Dave, let me turn to you. I mean, you're quite familiar, I guess, with especially in the pharma industry with large research spendings. Um, and maybe this time calls for a slightly different approach, uh, putting maybe the skill building more more in the in the forefront. But what would you recommend to someone like like Jean Eric, wondering um, what to spend the money? Yeah, no, I mean that's it's it, it's it's a good point, and I think that really, from my perspective, we really need to bring collaborations to the forefront. Uh, you know, whether it is, you know, it's the public sector along with industry. Um, we need to bring the digital skills and these digital advances to the current employment role. I mean, people have been talking about what do you do to train and to maybe co-credential various different, uh, you know, newly hired or newly, uh, you know, educated individuals, but we've got a large workforce out there that needs to be upskilled with regards to their digital skills. And uh, and one of the things that's really important, and this is something that, you know, Celine will be uh, very <laughs> aware of, uh, you know, from my perspective, working in uh, medical education, is that, you know, we need to consider adult learning principles with regards to the kinds of upskills that are needed. And a lot of that is actually being uh, learning in the workplace and learning that is actually relevant to what the individual is doing from day to day. And, uh, you know, in the healthcare sector, there's more and more uh, instances, uh, specifically in the universities and in the public sector, where a lot of that is actually being done and the time is being provided to those learners, the workers really, to be able to have the time to do the learning that's needed to make sure that they have the proper skills to implement some of these new technologies, the evolution of machine learning, the bringing in of the tools of artificial intelligence to help them do their work. I mean, all of this stuff is, is really, to me, uh, would be my wish list and, and seeing if we can get that kind of increased collaboration and facilitation of the current workers that we thank, have. Thank you. So, Celine, you can, you can wrap it up here with your answer and let me, for you, pose the question slightly differently. These large funding programs, and of course, you are one of the, one of the big beneficiaries of European R&D funding, they touch a lot of people, but not everybody gets, tr gets training through it. Uh, the graduate students and others, of course, get get courses taught, but all the other researchers in the programs that EIT Health is also overseeing, right, they, they are not necessarily beneficiaries of a specific skill building program. Could we do something there and make sure everybody who is in those programs in one way or another gets an opportunity to upgrade their skills? Uh, absolutely, and, and uh, an area that uh, we are looking at increasingly at EIT Health is, is uh, well, nurturing and developing communities of practice so is that as when you enter the the ecosystem say of of uh, eit health then it's you you it, it used to be well you i come in i consume a a school a program a whatever then i'm out of it and i'm out and we're really trying to get a lifelong learning um uh, uh, mechanism and just like they'll I mean, uh, embracing and promoting those those models uh, that that do work. When Dale was talking, I came to mind the master adaptive learner, which is also very much yeah. used into into the, the the healthcare sector, but could be certainly tweaked and deployed uh, elsewhere. So yes, I mean, getting the sense of community and the, the lifelong engagement would be key for any uh, such change to materials, be it cultural. Uh, skills based or other. 
Thank you very much, Celine. It brings us to the end of our session, 1.15 here in Munich and Brussels and elsewhere, but not in Princeton, New Jersey, where it's now seven <laughs> o'clock. Good morning, Dale. <laughs> it's going to be a long day for you now. I want to thank my guests here, um, Celine, Isabella, uh, Thomas and Dale. Uh, it was fun discussing with you. I hope you in the audience, you found it interesting and stimulating. Uh, take the ideas further, uh, engage in exchange, and I'll try to distill one or two points for Jean-Éric Paquet this afternoon. So if you're tuning into that session, then you hopefully will recognize uh, the question that I put together for Rich to ask. Thanks, Thank everybody, you. and have Thank a, you, a good rest of the conference. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.